And this session coming up is Antonio, and he's going to be talking about building an operating system on the edge. If you just want to come up here, Antonio. And can you hear me? Yep, coming in loud and clear. Uh, no video, though. Uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, oh. And uh, can you see that? Cool. Yep, you're working. Uh, let me. Okay, so camera is not working. I'm sorry for that. Um, well, I guess we can go without that. Uh, <clears throat> so assuming you can see my screen and slides should be up. Uh, so first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this presentation. My name is Antonio. I'm usually known as uh, Rancom online. Um, I work at Red Hat, where I used to work on containers uh, with Docker at the beginning. And now I'm working for the Edge team for about a year, where guess what? As the slide says, we're building an operating system for the Edge. Uh, in this talk, uh, the agenda is like this. We're going to first uh, so, you know, introduce what Edge and Edge computing is, uh, really brief. Uh, what are the requirements that we have to meet in order to operate at the edge? Because it's going to be different from, you know, the usual data center model. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into um, the most important technologies that we are using uh, today uh, to, you know, to enable this uh, use case at the edge. And then I'll, you know, uh, we'll put all of this together into what we called uh, Rel for Edge, and I'll give a brief demo of uh, one of the uh, key components of of the whole um, technology. So Edge. So in a live conference, I would have done a joke here. So everybody, uh, you cannot click that link, but if you want, you can go uh, on Google and type Edge. That may give you a hint of what Edge is or not, uh, but it was funny if it was live. So you can do that. Uh, other than that, jokes aside, uh, what is edge computing? So edge computing uh, is a computing that takes place at or near the physical location of either the user or the source of data. This definition is spread across the internet, but it's, uh, it's intuitive to think about edge computing as uh, use cases like automotive vehicles, uh, like your car as a small device, well, smallish device uh, that lets you uh, be connected while you drive. So that's definitely a huge, uh, an edge use case. Uh, you can think of edge computing as, uh, you know, light bulbs uh, on the street too, with sensor uh, to turn them off uh, when, it, when the sun is up or on when the sun is going down or think about the forecast sensors at the top of the mountain. All of these are edge use cases. Uh, other great examples span from the 5G network. Um, I'm sure everybody heard about that. Um, to, you know, you name them like submarines, uh, tanks, whatever. Uh, all of this, uh, which is different from the data center, um, uh, it's what we call edge computing. And as said here, uh, the computation takes place near uh, the physical location uh, or you know of the either user or the source of data um, so there is this difference uh, between um, you know data center and the edge um, so in a data center one of the uh, first uh, difference that we can see, of course, it's the hardware itself. In the data center, we have like big supercomputers, uh, really heavy, whether at the edge, we usually have single board computers, um, those tiny devices like a Raspberry Pi or a Fitlet 2. Um, and those usually don't have much resources. In the data center, like those supercomputers or, com you know, just servers have plenty of CPUs, uh, more than one. Uh, sometimes, Plenty of network connectivity, like in you know gigabit Ethernet, uh, directly connected to the rack. Uh, plenty of memory, uh, but just not limited uh, 
at you know one or two gig uh, whether again at the edge we usually have devices with no more than two gig top i'd say uh, but usually you'll work with uh, much less storage is also a key factor uh, for edge versus data center in the data center you have like san um, you know uh, the cloud itself is um, you know unlimited storage if you if you want to use that uh, whether at the edge we have you know not that much space to to work with so the requirements for for edge and for building an operating system um, are like the first one is of course um, it's not directly related to the um, to the operating system itself but the hardware as i said earlier is going to be small of course uh, resources are going to be limited that impacts the operating system itself uh, we cannot uh, spare memory or ask the device to do you know uh, cpu intensive computation or you know um, think that it has you know unlimited network connectivity um, that is always stable so none none of that is available at the edge or you know in the in the normal case it's not available we're assuming it's not available uh, security is also a key difference uh, at the data center usually uh, there is a an actual door to the to the data center itself where the uh, servers are racked uh, usually you need a badge you have to slide that somewhere and then you're allowed in there is access control in place so security from that perspective is is let's say it's high whether at the edge, uh, you know, you can go to the top of the mountain, uh, take that tiny device, bring that home, uh, unencrypt it if it's encrypted, and if you can, uh, you know, uh, unencrypt it, unencrypt it. Uh, so you can see there is there is a huge difference here. Uh, usually at the edge, you want to make sure that your device is not bulletproof, but it's uh, it's secure and nobody can can access it they can steal it of course uh physically but they won't be able to play with it update is also a key difference uh at the edge in the data center if something goes wrong you would send uh an it person to go there debug uh you know perhaps retry the update uh at some point that will go uh just fine at the edge if an update is uh you know has caused uh, an unbootable system, you're pretty much done with it because it's going to be, you know, it's a, it's going to be super expensive to send somebody uh, on the top of the mountain or somewhere at a remote location. Um, and, you know, for this reason, you want updates and, and management in general to be as smooth as possible and automated as possible so that you just deploy the device and then you manage that from a central location and if something goes wrong there are uh there, there's something that you can do uh to avoid uh sending somebody there uh provisioning uh, is what i just said uh, more or less it's zero touch and what we mean by that is you have an edge device um you know or a tiny device and in order to provision that you would just uh, send the device wherever it's needed and just plug it in uh, somewhere, power on, and everything is going to be taken care of uh, automatically without any intervention. So you, you don't need to send an engineer uh, at the site, the remote site, uh, to do all the configuration. So because in, in this scenario, uh, you probably have plenty of devices uh, tiny devices that you want to ship. So it's not maybe a huge uh, server where you configure it once, you send it to the data center, you power on, you configure it, uh, and then you're done. So the, this is also different. Uh, and management is the last one that I wanted to talk about uh, in the data center or in the cloud for what it's worth. Um, you know, Kubernetes is probably the default to run your workloads where you have plenty of RAM, plenty of CPU, uh, network is as you know it's uh, it's always up and running and it's fast um, on the edge this is not the case uh, most of those devices are going to be connected by a wi-fi uh, and there can be interruptions at any time it's not as tight as a as a data center uh, so in the edge use case we're not 
at this point. Uh, I'm sure you, you've seen the Microshift presentation. That's something that that team is tackling for sure. Uh, but you know, uh, Microshift itself is definitely tinier than, than a kubelet, uh, and it can run in less than two gig just fine. Um, so that's uh, that's about the, the you know the requirements that we have, uh, and um, let's uh, let's explore some of the technologies that we are using. Uh, this is a small list. Well, not that small, but it's a list of the key technologies that we've decided to use in order to make uh, this operating system uh, for the edge. And I'm going to explain them one by one, and then we'll you know gather all of this together into a demo. So the first one is um, you know the first technology that I'm sure everybody's familiar with is UFI. Um, you know, for the past 10 years, UFI has been the default on every Windows laptop, I guess, uh, I think. And definitely it has an advantage over, you know, the legacy BIOS, uh, which is it's secure. Uh, you can use TPM. And for us, uh, one, one requirement that I haven't mentioned is that um, usually you'll have, you know, a, a, a normal scenario would be you have a hundred of devices that you want to install this operating system onto. And, you know, uh, if you're familiar with Pixie, um, that, that, that has been a way to install on more than one device in the past, but Pixie is unsecure because it's GFTP uh, and it's slow. So one advantage of UFI over, um, over BIOS or Pixie itself is that UFI provides us with HTTP and HTTPS boot. That means on a manufacturer plant, um, if you need to provision a uh, thousand of devices, thousand devices, you would just bring up an HTTP server, uh, deploy the kernel and the initRD, and just power on those devices that are going to automatically connect to this uh, HTTP server and just install. Um, so this this was the reason why we went um, full UFI. Um, this new operating system is going to support uh, just UFI. Uh, we of course taken RHEL uh, for as a base for our operating system for the edge. Um, I think uh, there is very few to say here, but you know RHEL is trusted by many in the data center. It's battle tested, so our task here was to make it ready for the edge. And um, you know RHEL runs on most any platform out there that we you know that it's supported. Uh, so the the task here was. Uh, to make it, you know, leaner and, and smaller so that it can fit on a on a tiny device that we can ship at the edge. Uh, and of course, uh, the next technology that we're gonna uh, talk about and that we're gonna use and we're using uh, in this new operating system is OS3 and RPM OS3. Uh, and this is what, you know, OpenShift is also using um, by Arcos and Fedora CoreOS, and it has a huge advantage of being, you know, transactional, uh, image-based upgrades. Uh, and for us, the most important part uh, for choosing uh, OS3 and RHEL was the ability to roll back um, the operating system. So mm -hmm. updates are transactional. You just stage them first, and then you deploy them at the next reboot. So if an update is available at the edge, uh, the edge device would fetch it, stage it, and then at some point when you know the, the management platform of the, the operators uh, think it's time, they can just you know, reboot the machine and they will uh, you know boot into the new update. Um, and of course, with S3 and RPM S3, we can make uh, our own derivatives. So that's uh, something we're exploring also um, for our for Edge. Uh, Paired with that, there is this tool that we're going to use, which is called Brimboot, and it's an alt-check framework for systemd on RPM OS3. What this mean? This is highly tied to OS3 and RPM OS3 uh, from the slides before, because if a an update uh, goes wrong at the next boot uh, by using Brimboot, we are able to um, to notify that and also um, 
you know, take action on that and say, okay, if the update went wrong, uh, what we're going to do is just boot into the old deployment, which was working. Uh, and along with that, we can do all sort of uh, things like notifying a central management platform or send an email to uh, the IT department and say, uh, you know, this, this went wrong and, you know, this is not updated. You should take action uh, on it. Uh, the next piece uh, that I'm going to talk about is CoreOS Installer. Um, CoreOS Installer is how uh, is the way we we are uh, installing the the this operating system onto our device. So on edge devices, our flow is to build a raw image and then flash that to the device device. Um, you know, it can be an SSD or a memory card or whatever. CoreOS installer fits perfectly this requirement. What we need is just a flashing mechanism. So, um, you know, with uh, optional uh, compression support, so you can take uh, an XZ compressed image, uh, run CoreOS installer, and that will flash that, you know, will DD that image uh, onto a device. Uh, you know, we've chosen um, CoreOS installer because uh, it has a Dracut module that we've been developing. So that means uh, we can ship a tiny inter D system based on RHEL, on RHEL of course, uh, that runs CoreOS installer and does uh, the flashing for us and just reboot. Uh, it has, we've added encryption support so that it can work with an uh, encrypted raw image as well. And I'm gonna talk about encryption uh, later in the slide too. Uh, it has a systemd based framework to integrate with. What it means is that it's run as a systemd service. So if we have anything that we want to plug in between CoreOS installer, um, whether you know it's before that or after that, there is systemd that does that for us. Uh, and lastly, it has support for um, growing the root fault system. So usually the raw images are in the order of you know one or two gig um, in size. Uh, but maybe your uh, device has a 40 gig or even an 100 gig uh, storage device. So, you know, after flashing that, you definitely want to um, grow the root fault system to take all the space uh, on the device itself. Uh, this brings us to, uh, to Anaconda. Um, I'm again, I'm sure, Everybody's familiar with this, but Anaconda is the uh, is the installer that we're using today for RHEL and Fedora. Um, you know, it has a nice GUI. Uh, you can click um, here and there, configure the system, install it, and then reboot, and you have your system installed. Uh, it is also a way to uh, to do that unattended by using kickstarts, um, where you config, you know, you script your configuration, your installation, and you can do that automatically too but it had some you know disadvantages for us uh, meaning um, I, mean, I wrote old code but that's not meant to be offensive of course but anaconda has been around forever uh, so it has code that we don't want to bring into the system or the installer itself because uh, it can be a potential attack surface so we're not shipping that we're not using anaconda for that reason and we needed something which was definitely smaller leaner and uh, that, you know, it does just what we need to, uh, which is flashing a raw image, do some configuration and just power off until somebody power it on at the site. Uh, so we haven't created a new installer that wasn't the, uh, the intention there. Uh, we're just not using Anaconda. And we instead uh, went and used uh, CoreOS installer. And we did that by, you know, packaging CoreOS installer in a way that we called, you know, the, the, the end artifact is called the simplified network installer. Uh, and it's just, you know, a tiny init RD system based on RHEL that has CoreOS installer uh, in it. Um, it boots only with UFI uh, for the reason I've, I've explained it earlier. We're just allowing uh, UFI here, uh, it won't boot on, legacy BIOS system um, for security reason. And also uh, 
this allows us to leverage HTTP and HTTPS boot. Um, so as I explained earlier, if you have a thousand of devices, uh, you would use the simplified network installer to provision them all at once, uh, but just you know, powering on the device um, and the device itself is gonna reach the server and do the, the configuration. Uh, so the simplified network installer is just this tiny initRD system uh, based on RHEL with CoreOS installer and also contains a raw image of the system that we want to install. That's, uh, that's RHEL uh, with OS3 as explained earlier. Um, and it's integrated with a FIDO FDO. I'm going to talk about that um, in a moment, but it's, uh, um, it's the way we're going to uh, provision and onboard, um, maybe just onboard uh, the, the device to a management platform and do the configuration. Um, it comes with two artifacts uh, with, you know, HTTP boot. Uh, it's the main scenario that we're going to tackle with simpl the simplified network installer, but we, we're shipping the artifact as an ISO so that if you want to test that, you can just flash the ISO onto a USB stick, plug that into your Fitla 2 and just run the installation, which is of course unattended because we don't need anybody to, um, you know, to attend that because it's completely automatic. Uh, and this brings us to FIDO FDO um, somewhere. Yeah, um, so yesterday, Patrick, uh, my colleague on the team, uh, did a great presentation around uh, FIDO FDO. I'm, uh, I'm skimming through um, FIDO here just to give you uh, an idea of what, what this is. Uh, and so the, you know, FIDO FDO is a uh, Fire Alliance uh, IoT specification. And FDO is FIDO device onboard, which is an automatic onboarding protocol for IoT devices. So device onboarding is the process of installing secrets and configuration data into a device. Uh, again, go watch Patrick's session because he explained this in deep details. Uh, and so uh, the device onboarding, as I said, is the process of installing secrets and configuration data into a device so that the device is able to connect and interact securely with, for instance, an IoT platform. And the IoT platform is then used by the device owner to manage the device itself, like patching security vulnerabilities, installing or updating software, retrieving sensor data, uh, interacting with act actuators and whatnot. Uh, and what it's important for us is that FIDO device on board is an automatic onboarding mechanism, uh, meaning that it's invoked autonomously and performs only limited specific interaction uh, with the whole environment to complete. And this, this, this was of course, one of the key requirements that we had to meet. Uh, you can see at the at the bottom there is a configuration that uh, that's probably one of the most important uh, thing that we need to because uh, we're going to install uh, the operating system and then <clears throat> we need to configure it to be able to run at the edge. Um, this is a slide taken for from the from the FIDO page uh, that just explained the flow of provisioning and onboarding with FIDO. Uh, assuming you can see my cursor, uh, you know, the device is built at the manufacturer uh, plant. Uh, and at that point, uh, the manufacturer uh, creates what we call, what it's called a device credential. Then it will just pack it up uh, and just ship it to, you know, to a customer or to, uh, to a site if it has to be deployed. And, you know, the, at least the mind blowing thing for me here is that once it's shipped and it has a device credential uh, already on the device itself, if you just power it on, uh, the whole protocol is gonna take care of registering the device to a device management system and do the onboarding, meaning you, know, you regist register the device, you ship some you know, initial security update, you create an SSH key for the for an administration or the administrator account uh, and whatnot. So all of this is taken care of by uh, by FDO or you know FIDO uh, secure device onboarding. Um, and then of course the device is is you know is ready to to run at the edge. Uh, the the architecture of, of FIDO itself um, 
you know, it has some pieces that needs to be deployed and some pieces has to be, um, have to be into uh, the system itself. Uh, for the initial part at the manufacturer plant, there is going to be a manufacturing server uh, and then a client is gonna be run from the simplified installer where it's gonna ask the server to, um, you know, validate and create those device credential uh, on the, again, on the client side, on the system itself, there is a client that uses those device credential uh, to authenticate against, uh, you know, here there is, there is a rendezvous and owner onboarding server that's the, on the central management, uh, so on, the, on the device management system. And that's where uh, the device is gonna authenticate um, with that and receive configuration updates and everything. There's also a debug tool um, just to make sure devices device credentials are uh, correct in, in you know, any debug-related situation. Uh, there is a link in this slide, which I'm sure I'm gonna share at the end. Uh, as I said earlier, this is, there was a presentation yesterday from Patrick. I uh, did a great overview on FIDO, so I, I encourage everybody to go and have a look at that. Um, <clears throat> this is, just a split down of the of what FIDO does uh, for us. At, I think I've explained that earlier at provisioning, which is at the manufacturing uh, site, when the installer runs, we get the credentials from the manufacturing server and we store them uh, either on the file system, which is what we're doing right now, or you know, in the future, it can be the TPM for security reason. And at onboarding, those credentials are used <clears throat> to security, securely onboard the device. Um, this brings us to another uh, key requirement of running an operating system at the edge, uh, which is encryption, because we don't want the device to be stolen and just, you know, somebody will uh, rip off the uh, storage and read um, data if there are, if there's, you know, sensitive, uh, sensible data onto the device. So we don't want that. What we're gonna do is encrypting by default. Um, we're not uh, shipping this new operating system unencrypted. Uh, what we did was turning on uh, full disk encryption by using locks uh, and by, uh, this is not yet ready, but the aim is um, at installation time, uh, we're gonna encrypt the device uh, storage with a pin. Um, if you're not familiar with Clavis, you know, there are various pins that you can use. One of you know most famous is the, the TPM pin or the SSS or the TANG pin. So the first thing we're gonna do at installation uh, is flashing a raw image, which is encrypted with a null pin, meaning it has encryption, but of course it's open to everybody. Uh, and then at onboarding, which is when, as I said, the configuration happens and you know the, the, the device itself may start to receive data that we don't wanna leak. Uh, at that point, at onboarding time, the device itself is gonna re-encrypt itself using a strong key and storing that into the TPM uh, or, you know, for now it's TPM, uh, but I'm sure we'll come up with even um, things more, more, more secure than that. Uh, so that the device it's fully encrypted at any time. And the question that we often get is uh, what if, um, device is, is broken at some point. Uh, well, that, that was the, um, the reason for, uh, for doing full disk encryption. If it's broken, you can leave it at the top of the mountain. Uh, even if somebody steals that, yeah, they can crack encryption. That's gonna take a long time. So uh, it's uh, highly unlikely. Uh, and this is again, a key difference uh, with the data center um, scenario where if your device breaks, again, you can send somebody uh, at the top of the, well, not the top of, in the data center uh, to debug that. <clears throat> so the next technology that we are uh, leveraging for this new operating system is OS Build, and OS Build Composer. Uh, it's where we put all of this together. Uh, we say, uh, you know, OS Build, OS Build Composer supports pipelines as this comp concept of pipelines. And what we did there was creating a pipeline to create uh, an OS3 rel um, based system, commit that to an OS3 commit, of course, 
deploy that and create a raw image and then uh, you know bring that raw image onto an ISO where the simplified network installer <clears throat> is so that you know those artifacts are ready for the user to use uh, or customers. Uh, so this is where we put all, all the things together. The end result of, of this is you know usually an ISO where you have the rel raw image and the simplified network installer and you're ready to go and uh, <clears throat> install and deploy uh, the system at the edge. Uh, and it has, again, this advantage for us, it's uh, highly configurable in code. We just have to take care of a pipeline, defining packages, defining, uh, you know, the configuration that we need, like initial kernel arguments and, and, and things like that. So it works, we have an hosted version and an on-prem version uh, that allows everybody to run it uh, and, you know, have their own internal flow for this. <clears throat> And of course, we're gonna use containers. Uh, the, FIDO, um, <clears throat> the FIDO servers that we're gonna use and that I'm gonna uh, demo just one, the manufacturing server. Then there are other two servers, the rendezvous server and the owner onboarding server. Uh, those three servers are gonna be run in containers, um, but we have plans with Podman, of course. Uh, we have plans of, um, running everything in containers um and i've yeah, just that's a, a semi joke including bash in the future uh we we may need uh, to do that at some point we'll not need we may want to do that at some point uh because we want to lower the attack surface on the device itself so if we can run everything in containers that's definitely uh, more secure and meets the security requirement that we gave ourselves earlier um yeah so this is around this is all around the technologies that we are using right now uh of course this is gonna evolve uh we are we are you know it's down working on this it has been over a year but we keep working on this and we're gonna you know work on this uh, then let's get to the demo hopefully nothing is gonna break uh, what I wanted to show is the initial uh, phase of, you know, pretty much the workflow that I've explained so far. Uh, we need to build a simplified installer, network installer. Uh, we'll see that it's going to be an ISO. Uh, as I explained, the ISO can be unpacked onto an HTTP web server, and then you can have UFI on devices um, connect to that and install it. For the sake of the demo, uh, you know, I'm sure that would have, uh, you know, would be broken if I if I did that. So for the sake of the demo, we're using the ISO directly. Uh, still boots with just UFI, and I'm gonna use a virtual machine on my laptop uh, to do that. So first of all, as I've uh, I've outlined it into this slide. You can see the, the first part of this is done at the manufacturing uh, plant where the devices are, are actually assembled uh, and then provisioned. Uh, so you, they need the simplified network installer uh, as a mean to put the system on the device itself. So they need um, the FIDO part that they need is the manufacturing server. And if we go here, I'm sure this is super tiny and you cannot see that. Uh, but what's running at the very bottom is a manufacturing server. Uh, and that's it, that's the server, it's running in a container, of course, and that's the server that takes care of um, creating and handling device credentials on the new device. Uh, then right here, uh, we're using West Build Composer to run uh, and create the simplified network installer. I've created that already because it takes 15 minutes and we don't have the whole day uh, today. So I just want to explain <clears throat> what, you know, uh, how we use OS build to build the simplified network installer. And it's just a matter of defining a TOML configuration file where, uh, you know, we name it, you know, somehow I'm choosing rel 9 uh, as the uh, distribution to use. That's also the one that I've used 
uh, for the raw image itself, so for the actual system that gets installed on the device. Uh, and you can see that the simplified network installer requires very few configuration to be to be put here. Uh, the first thing that, that it has to know about is you know the storage device that it has to install to. Uh, of course, I'm using virtual machine, so the target device that I want to write the raw image to is slash dev slash VDA, uh, but this can be anything. Like uh, on my Fitla 2 is dev SDB or whatever. Of course, um, this is something that is required upfront. Um, in the future, uh, we may be experimenting with automatic detection of a storage device or partition that, that has turned out to be difficult uh, for various reasons. Uh, but perhaps we're going to explore that. Uh, but suffice to say that right now you just need a target uh, device to install to. And then at the bottom, you can see this is the most important thing that we have to configure because uh, the installation will ask this server uh, to provide device credentials, you know, authenticate against the server itself uh, and write those credentials uh, to the uh to the system to the installed system the last line is a is a security mechanism uh to authenticate against the manufacturing server uh, this is using http but it you know we have support for uh we will have i think support for https uh, but this ash right here is uh is a way to authenticate against the actual manufacturing server because uh the protocol exchanges certificates uh, and so that's, you know, that's just a security measure. Uh, I'm not going to say that you can disable this altogether, but you can, but for the demo, we're leaving it here so that it's, uh, you know, secure. Uh, and then the, so yeah, so I think what we can do is I'll show you the simplified installer. I'm not sure you can see this. Uh, so I've mounted the simplified installer uh, at mount ISO. I want to show the size of the installer itself. It's a you know 787 meg, so this fits uh, even on a CD-ROM. But edge devices won't have CD-ROM. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> what what I did there was just unpack it so that we we can see what's inside. Um, and I think the first thing that we all know this is the red disk image .xz. That's the actual operating system that gets uh, flashed onto the device. Uh, as you can see, it's compressed. Uh, but as I've explained earlier, CoreOS installer uh, supports that, so there's there's no issue there. Uh, and you can also see the you know the usual directory structure to make. Um, this bootable and this is just UFI as you can see. Here we have the initRD and VM Linux kernel. Uh, in the initRD, it's you know that's where CoreOS installer is uh, and all the FIDO FDO um, clients are running is are gonna run. Uh, VFI folder contains usually VFI structure. Uh, there is grab.com that we can look at um, and uh, we can check out some of the options for this installation um, of course there is the kernel that we we have to run there is network which is required to uh, to reach out to the manufacturing server and do the initial device credential exchange uh, there is this crypto root equal one. Uh, this is a stopgap for now until we land a feature upstream so that it's encrypted by default. I'm gonna drop that once we install. Uh, we can see that the th through the uh, kernel arguments, we're gonna also configure uh, the target storage device. 
we're telling CoreOS installer to grab this uh, disk image, this raw image. Uh, of course, in the HTTP boot use case, you, you know there is an option which is not image file, but it's image URL, and you can point that anywhere on the internet to fetch uh, a raw image. In the HTTP boot case, uh, you know the manufacturer or whoever is installing the system surely has a, an HTTP server where you know they can point this option to, uh, and they will just fetch and install the the raw image from there. Uh, you know, this is all mirrored from the configuration. There is a manufacturing server URL. Uh, this insecure here is just for uh, for the demo itself because you know all of this is insecure. Uh, and this is then the uh, the security check on the ash uh, that the uh, the installer is going to do against the manufacturing server. Um, I think, yeah, this this is the simplified installer. And what I wanted to show is just how easy it is to install a system. I have my finger crossed because it worked just fine um, 10 minutes before this presentation. Uh, we're going to run, as I say, the virtual machine. Um, and you can see that I'm using UFI and the installer. So if I if we can start this one, uh, the font on the uh, I think I can do this. Yeah. Okay. So I hope everybody can see this. I cannot zoom on the on this virtual machine, but you can see text scrolling. Uh, and at around here where the cursor is, uh, we can see the command line that um, that has been just executed, which is CoreOS installer. And what this is doing is, uh, as I explained, it's taking that raw image, compressed raw image, uncompress it, and uh, you know, flashing that to the device. Uh, it's around 50% uh, right now. Uh, what's what's coming next is uh, we're gonna reach out to the manufacturing server. It's running here, and we can see that we're gonna hit that endpoint so that uh, the device it's uh, it's uh, the device credentials are gonna be created for this device. Uh, and again, in this case, it's just this virtual machine, but this applies to physical device too. And then at the very end, hopefully if this is not too fast because uh, what this does is just reboot into the installed system. Uh, we can see also the file system growing uh, routine where again, I've given 100 gig for this device as storage. The raw image is two gig or something uh, uncompressed. Uh, so when we boot into the, the actual system, uh, this failed, of course. It happens. Um, yeah, so I haven't dropped the uh, crypto root, so I think it's unencrypted. So let me do this one more time. I should have dropped that you can see this is a normal uh, boot message we're gonna drop this and we're gonna start the installation but you can see hopefully you could have you were able to see that the device at installation time, uh, went through the manufacturing uh, server because I left some space there, um, and that's what we're going to do again. So if you see logs there, that means uh, the installation hit the that endpoint, uh, and it's rolling again. Uh, so let's give it some more minutes, uh, some more seconds at this point uh, to go through, and then we're going to log in into the system. I'm gonna show um, 
D meanwhile. Uh, the configuration that we've baked into the into the raw image um, now it's just you know I've, I've said to do as build to create this raw image with just a username and admin and a password admin uh, in group will and I did that because uh, this is still going so I think I can briefly explain the owner onboarding uh, part of all of this. Uh, so again, go watch Patrick's presentation but for the sake of this demo. There has to be also a, a onboarding server that will use those device credential uh, to authenticate against uh, you know, this owner onboarding server. And you know when that happens, uh, the owner onboarding server is going to tell the device to do something. Uh, in this case, uh, for test purposes, uh, we've uh, we've said, okay, if a device uh, connects and it, you know, and you need to onboard that, uh, for the admin user, uh, create a, uh, an SSH key named test key. Of course, this is just for the demo, uh, but in real life, um, the owner onboarding server is going to provide actual SSH keys. Uh, another thing that we're doing uh, the very first time it boots, and you can see on the right side of my screen that it's booting, uh, and that it installed uh, rel 9 just fine. Uh, you know, the, in, uh, in the encryption case, uh, at this point, admin, admin, uh, there is a, there's gonna be the, uh, the client connecting to the owner onboarding server receive uh, you know, this configuration, like adding a user, uh, adding an SSH key for a user, re-encrypting the disk, and then at some point, the admin can just decide to reboot, and it's going to be uh, fully encrypted with a strong key stored into the TPM. And as I explained earlier, uh, the, the installation case, uh, it's encrypted, but it's encrypted with no key. So th that's just something that we need to do in order to provide um, a way to re-encrypt later and mandate encryption because that is again what we really want to do. Uh, so this is the installed system. Uh, you can see it's RHEL 9. Um, it's an OS3 based system. Uh, let me show uh, the release uh, file. And uh, we haven't noticed because that was too fast, but after flashing uh, the raw image to the, you know, to this virtual machine, the manufacturing uh, process kick, manufacturing server process kicked in, uh, and uh, you know um, that that worked. The system rebooted, and you have a fully working RHEL nine machine, RHEL for Edge nine machine. Let me go back here. So th that is the demo. I'm, you know, 50 minutes are <laughs> definitely not that much to explain everything and demo everything. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna end the session with the what's next uh, on, on our plate for for Ralph for Edge. Uh, we want to make the system smaller and smaller by removing unneeded packages or packages and and tools that we can run in containers. Uh, there is a a gap that we're filling around configuration. As I've explained, there is the owner onboarding server that does some initial configuration, but we need a better way to do that. So that's uh, another uh, area that we are exploring. I've mentioned ignition because uh, that's you know that would be a candidate or just a way to configure the system. Uh, and then um, what I haven't demoed uh, and what 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 are we we're working on too is a you know a device management system where you have a nice uh, UI uh, where you know you can see all the devices uh, you can update them you can see hey this device is at the version with the CV so you really need to update that you can see device that died perhaps uh, so they're not working anymore they're not pinging back to the server to the central uh, device management system um, and uh, this is it I left some links uh, at the end uh, those are the main one from there, you, you know, there are more links uh, to go um, and hit. And, uh, you know, everything that I've explained is contained uh, in those.
and I've just hit 50 minutes. Uh, thank you, everybody.